Hi everyone, um, and welcome to this month's um, Ramsey Hospital Research webinar series. Um, today we have some fantastic people from the Paul Ramsey Foundation to talk to us about one of their programs, Fire to Flourish. Um, so I'd like to welcome Yasmin and Galena um, on camera. Hello. Um, so I'll start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, so I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. So welcome um, everyone um, and thank you for joining us. Um, please note this session is recorded and it will be available on, on our website uh, early next week um, for you to download or share with other people. Um, um, so today we'll do a presentation um, and there's an opportunity to post your questions in the, the Q&A uh, down at the bottom um, and we'll get to those towards the end of the presentation. Um, so I'd like to introduce you both, um, Yasmin Narivalala, sorry. <laughs> um, Yasmin leads the team that manages the Paul Ramsey Foundation's large portfolio of partners working to enhance their impact and drive progress um, against their mission. Um, and also she has her colleague, uh, Galena Laurie, who's the partnership manager. Um, and Galena manages a, a diverse portfolio of partnerships and has undertaken a range of projects for the foundation. Um, with her team, she's developed expertise in disaster recovery, which I think is what we're gonna hear about today. Early childhood development, um, supporting First Nations communities and place-based approaches. So I'm really excited to hear what these uh, wonderful ladies have to talk to us to about today um, and to learn a bit more about the Paul Ramsey Foundation. Um, and so I'm going to stop talking and turn my camera off and hand over to Yasmin. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. Thank you very much. And just while Galena brings the presentation up on screen, um, thank you for the introduction, Lena, and thank you to everyone that's joined us today for this presentation. Uh, before beginning, I'd also like to acknowledge that I am today on the lands of the Kamaragal people, and I would also wish to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are here with us today. So I joined the Paul Ramsey Foundation uh, around six months ago and am feeling extremely privileged and honoured and delighted to be part of the team working in an area which our CEO recently called the realm of hope and possibility. Um, and Galena and I are really looking forward to sharing a little of that with you today, um, providing a little bit of a, a background on what we do in the foundation, as well as sharing with you one of our recent partnerships that aims to help build resilience and support communities as they emerge from the absolutely horrific 2019-2020 bushfires. So maybe Galena, could we move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, a little bit about who we are. The Paul Ramsey Foundation exists because of the legacy of, of Paul Ramsey, um, a man who I never had the privilege to meet, but who dared to think differently and lived his life with humility and a deep respect and compassion for others. Paul established the foundation in 2006 and on his death in 2014 he left the majority of his estate to continue his philanthropy for generations to come. His generosity has created Australia's largest philanthropic foundation and we aim to make a lasting contribution to positive change in Australia. Since 2016, we've granted around 650 million Aussie dollars to around 200 partners. Uh, and we're currently granting in the region of 100 to 150 million per annum to various Australian entities. Um, the next slide, please. The foundation has chosen as its core ambition, a commitment to help break cycles of disadvantage in Australia so that all people and communities can thrive. 
we truly believe that there is some urgency for action around this. We are a wealthy nation and we pride ourselves on being lucky country. We believe that we're a country that's about fairness and a fair go, but our reality is starkly different. We have entrenched intergenerational poverty, pressing social issues and inequitable access to opportunity, which means that where someone is born and the community that they live in can affect their life outcomes. The impact of intergenerational disadvantage starts early in life with a lack of access to resources impacting future opportunities for too many before they even start school. We have a justice system that disproportionately incarcerates First Nations people, especially young people. We have a lack of access to affordable and appropriate housing, which increases homelessness and leaves too many in financial stress, unable to meet even their basic daily needs. And we have inequities in our social, educational and employment systems that affect people's opportunities, participation and their outcomes. But we believe, as Paul did, that we can make a difference and that there is a role for us to play consistent with Paul's own values to work to create a world where people can live their best lives. Can we move on to the next one, Karina, please? Thank you. So to do this, we know that we can't make a difference on our own and we need to work with partners to think systemically from early exploration of ideas to substantial investment in large programs to create impactful and lasting change. We focus on people in places experiencing disadvantage. And as a result, we strategically target four main areas of potential impact. The first of these is learning lives, which targets the critical foundations of education and development from the early years onwards. The second is justice and safety, where we recognize that too many of our young people are derailed by contact with the criminal justice system and that systems are inadequate to end family and domestic violence and address its consequences. The third is transitions to employment. We accept that the critical pathways to secure stable work are not equitable. And the fourth, which we're gonna spend a little bit more time on today is community adaptability, where we acknowledge the importance of place, its resources, strengths, opportunities, and its ability to respond to adversity. Um, next, next slide, please, Jeff. Thanks. So the foundation uh, has a team of around 60. Uh, we've been growing very fast, so it might be a little more than that at the moment. And our work focuses on the four areas that are shown on the slide in front of you, granting and investing, building, convening and enabling, and influencing. Um, partners that we work with have access not just to funding, but to connections, capability supports, and knowledge and expertise. Our goal is to apply people and place-centered systems thinking to really seek and listen to different perspectives, to empower and to measure if we're making a difference. Ultimately, our aim is to try to follow Paul's lead and leave a legacy which will benefit many generations to come. And uh, finally, just on the next slide, Galena. Our values are those that were embodied by Paul himself and they're centered around humility, respect and compassion. We aim to live these every day and embody these in our work with our partners such as the ones that we're working with on the Fire to Flourish program, which Galena will now share a little bit more with you. So with that, uh, Galena, I might hand over to you after that brief introduction to talk a little bit more about the substance of what we do. I'm on mute. I think I would know by now. Thanks very much, Yasmin, and thanks uh, for having us. Um, Ramsey um, Healthcare, it's very lovely to be um, with you today. Um, I, I'm coming from Gadigal country here in Sydney today, and I would also just like to acknowledge the um, many communities, the many First Nations communities that have been impacted by the fires um, and also by other natural disasters since the 2019-20 fires. 
and to um, note that Indigenous knowledge is a kind of cr critical input, I think, to us successfully responding to these sorts of um, natural disasters. So Fight a Flourish is a program that was funded in 2020 in response to the 2019-20 bushfires. And I just wanted to, to leave this slide here for a minute because it started with, I think, a moral imperative from the board about um, us being Australia's uh, largest philanthropic foundation and that we really needed to make um, uh, a commitment in response to the, to the bushfires. Um, and that ended up being quite a significant commitment of $30 million. So that happened, you know, we came back from kind of summer holidays in January 2020. And I think a lot of people in the organisation were saying, what can we do? What can we do? Quite a lot of us had been on holidays or uh, new people down the coast or up the coast or, you know, so I think there was a really strong personal sense of um, wanting to do something um, to help the communities that have been impacted. So, so we had that amazing commitment from the board. Um, and then we needed to think about how we were, what we were going to do with that. Um, and so we decided we needed to listen to, to people who had more experience um, with this than we did. We were very lucky at the time that our CEO, um, Glenn Davis, uh, was a Victorian and had been really involved in the Black Saturday bushfires um, and the recovery from that and had been involved in the distribution of the funds through the Victorian um, bushfire recovery fund. So um, had both the experience of kind of being part of that recovery effort, but also was quite well connected to people in um, Victoria. So uh, we had um, uh, we had some conversations uh, with a lot of people who'd been involved in those um, Black Saturday bushfires, as well as people who um, were trying to respond to the current situation um, in government um, at the state level, but also at the national level. Um, and we, we, all, we knew that we didn't, we hadn't worked in this area specifically, although we had um, made some investments in places, I suppose. So we, we had thought about that, but we hadn't responded to disasters before. Uh, what we heard were um, exhortations to fund over the long term to um, really listen to community, um, to think about the um, social fabric of communities and how that might have been impacted by the fire, um, to differentiate ourselves from government so that we were doing different things, um, we weren't duplicating, we were being complementary. Um, so those were the kinds of, uh, I guess the other thing we heard was, you know, long th these uh, recovery from these sorts of events takes a long time and uh, communities, so, so funding um, uh, over the long term is, is a, a you know, desirable thing. I think we were also cautioned, to, uh, cautioned against really putting our emphasis on the immediate aftermath of the fire, um, because that's where there's a lot of money that comes from government and from fundraisers. Um, so to kind of wait till later down the track. Uh, so, so that was really, really useful intel. Really, people were very generous with their with their time. Um, we then had uh, we we sort of thought we would like to work in a few places, not not broad not broad brush, but to really sort of see if we could support a few communities for a reasonable period of time to work quite deeply with those communities. So we needed to think about where where we would work, and we did some work to map um, the extent of the burnt area and overlay that with some indicator, indicators of disadvantage. Because as Yasmin has said, um, you know, we really want to create um, an Australia where people can thrive and we wanted to focus on, we, we, had a, we had a thesis, I guess, that people who had less resources before the fires would probably come out of the fires with even fewer resources and would take longer to recover. So we wanted to see, you know, what where the places were that we might be able to make make the best biggest impact. So we did that work. Um, we also made some reasonably small investments along the way, um, mostly to organisations that were either working directly with community, were working directly with First Nations community, or were thinking about and working with children and young people. Um, 
as groups that had traditionally been um, left out of the recovery process. So I'm just gonna. Um, so um, then we went into a design phase to think about how we would spend the bulk of the funding in the small number of communities over the longer term. Um, so PRF was a partner in that along with some other um, some other organisations, including the Australian Centre for Social Innovation um, and uh, the, uh, Metal, uh, the um, Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And we essentially worked together um, to in, engage community, um, to hear what communities had to say about what they needed and what the opportunities were before we kind of made a final decision about what we were going to do. Um, so part of the work that we did was over a kind of four month period was to reach out into community. And I guess as everybody else had been, we were also impacted by COVID. We couldn't go into community physically. So we had to do it all virtually, which was quite challenging. Um, and I think that what we found when we did make connections with communities that was that that COVID impact was really challenging as well, because the traditional ways in which they might come together to recover were just not really possible. Um, so, you know, everything had moved online, people couldn't get together. Um, Indigenous communities were incredibly worried about um, COVID coming into their communities. So that was an added layer of complexity. So uh, we, we were reduced to the online, online approach, which was, which was really challenging. Um, but the intel that we got from communities was absolutely instrumental in terms of how we shaped the program. And it really um, it reflected what we'd heard earlier on as well about what was, what was where the gaps were, what was important for us to do in terms of what, we, what government couldn't do, those sorts of things. Um, and so what we ended up with was uh, a partnership with the Monash Sustainable Development Institute to develop fire, what became known as Fire to Flourish. Um, Monash works uh, in, in collaboration with um, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, who leads the work on the community engagement and community um, development. And uh, our other partner, significant partner, is uh, Metal Manufacturers Australia. So during the course of the development of the approach, metal manufacturers approached us and said that they were interested in funding. Um, they, they're an organisation with a lot of outlets across the country, a bit like uh, Ramsey Healthcare. And they knew that their members were likely to have been affected by bushfires and you know, had been affected by bushfires and would want to make a difference. So in the end, um, they matched the funding um, that we put in. So it became a $50 million program. So it's very generous of them and also incredibly kind of great, great for the program. Um, so that's when we got to Fire to Flourish. So Fire to Flourish is a five year transdisciplinary program working at the intersection of disaster resilience and community development. Um, and the idea behind Fire to Flourish is that communities lead their own recovery. Um, it's not about us saying to communities, this is what you should do. It's about us listening to communities to um, hear what they think is important and where they think the opportunity is. Um, one of the things that we think uh, makes this program different is that um, it focuses on disadvantage, uh, which is uh, a gap in the current disaster resilience um, landscape. Uh, we had some, we, we, we continue to have some challenges, I think, in how we talk about this because communities don't think of themselves as disadvantaged. And um, uh, so the language that we use has become quite important to think about. So the idea of the program is that we um, support communities to lead their own recovery um, and build their own, we'll sort of set out their, develop a plan and a vision for their own future well being. Um, and then at the same time, we're trialing and scaling innovations in community-led resilience uh, so that these can be more broadly applied. So the, the approach is to um, work in four communities to support them with community-led resilience building, to conduct some research, to build the evidence, data and insight that um, leads to reforms, and to um, connect community level and system level reforms. Because we know that working in communities um, is one approach, but there's also policy and funding challenges at the macro level that um, need to be addressed as well. 
Uh, so the vision at the time was that disadvantaged bushfire affected communities have the agency capabilities and institutional support to create and sustain conditions for resilient and thriving futures. So that's really looking at um, not just funding for grants, I suppose, but really trying to understand um, from communities what they need, what they see is really important and um, how they, they might build their own kind of strengths, how they might build their own leadership capability um, and so that they can um, really engage more with institutions and funders and that, that kind of thing. Um, we had a go at thinking of what success will look like in five years time and um, it'll be really interesting. We're now one and a half years in. It'll be interesting to see how this goes. Um, so kind of three areas. One is that the, the communities in which we work are on a new trajectory, that there's more active participation at the local level. Local organisations have been strengthened and that there's um, a new, a strengthened current and emerging generation of leaders with a shared vision for that community. Um, so if, if that happens, we think we'll have been successful. Um, we hope that there'll be better support and coordination at a systems level. Um, so at the macro funding and policy level, that there are improved mechanisms and infrastructure to share knowledge, um, but also that there's a, a greater ability for funders to hear the voices of community um, and that this will actually influence the way funding flows. So we'll, we'll, we're keeping track of that. Um, so the things that make our program distinctive, um, and this is uh, what we set out to do, this is how we saw it at the beginning, but I think it still probably holds true, that um, we recognise um, resilience building is um, a five to 10 year journey and it's probably longer than that, to be honest. Um, that we uh, can incre increase access to resources, that there could be better coordination across players and we can um, in increase the scale, but only by working together. Um, we understand that, um, I guess, disasters can amplify and compound disadvantage and uh, we really would like to sort of take a different approach in that disasters can also provide a, a moment in time, an opportunity for um, changing the trajectory of the community so that um, it's a moment for communities to go, well, what do we really want? How can we go forward together um, with a vision for you know, a better future. So trying to um, take that, uh, that approach as well. Um, we recognise that communities are best placed to lead and decide how funds are used. So we fund flexibly across all resilience um, domains. So we're not saying, well, you only need to do, you only need to rebuild community halls or you only need to rebuild roads and fences. We're saying, well, that's really important to do that, but you might also need some economic recovery, like how are local businesses going? Um, you might need um, people very connected to their environments. You know, how might you support them to, um, to, to rebuild the environment, whether it's through land care, bush care, that kind of thing. Um, but also how do you actually support the, the people, the humans who've been affected um, by the disaster? Um, this slide is kind of uh, just trying to set out um, the, the kind of the way the program was set up. So there's a, a at its core is um, a local chain. And, and can I just say that the circles are not about the amount of funding that goes to each area. Um, the bulk of the funding goes to local change, um, but it's kind of local change at the heart of it. Then around that, you've got the system level change. And then sitting around that is the kind of program um, management, program governance. Um, there are some principles which have been established to guide the program's work. Um, these are probably not surprising, uh, but they're, it's around being community led so that community shapes, drives and owns the program and their voices are foregrounded. Um, being strengths based and trauma informed that we respect people's lived experiences, we recognise and build our, on, on strengths. Uh, rather than having deficit language and deficit approach and we support collective healing. Um, we foreground Aboriginal wisdom, respecting the sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, learn from and incorporate Indigenous ways of knowing and being into the program and foster strong um, collaborations. Uh, we try to be holistic and impactful. We address inequities, enhance inclusion and self-determination, and we try and learn, adapt and evolve. 
And in lots of ways, that's why Monash um, Sustainable Development Institute seemed like a good um, lead partner for this work because they have the kind of research infrastructure around um, this in, in addition to um, experience in the international development space of doing this kind of work. Uh, the, FOS, the focus communities are, three of them are in New South Wales, um, one of them is in Victoria, and you can see from the map that they all have a slightly different approach. So with Tenterfield, the, um, the focus will be on the Tenterfield town and its surrounds. Um, with the um, Victorian example, it's really uh, um, a stretch along um, the south coast from Cabbage Tree Creek, really through to Can River, not quite as far as Malacuja, I think. Um, up in northern New South Wales, um, there are four uh, dis discrete communities, all of which sort of are not that far from Grafton, I suppose, um, although some of them are quite, quite far away. But um, a collective of people have come, have come together to, to, um, work th to work together there. And in the south coast, it's in the strip from Batemans Bay to Wallaga Lake. Um, um, this slide really just uh, sets out some of the things that have happened since we um, started the project. Um, it also includes some of the um, other natural disasters that have happened, including floods and COVID lockdowns. Um, I guess one of the things that we um, uh, that doesn't particularly uh, get shown from this uh, slide is that uh, communities have come on board at different pace at a different different paces, which really speaks to the idea that communities um, are all having a different experience and have a diff have had a different experience of recovery from these floods. So some are more able to start the work of. Um, thinking about the future than others. So um, that, that's impacts on the way the program has been implemented. Um, I might just pause and uh, show a short video now. This um, video is uh, shows some uh, people from the Clarence Valley who have been involved in Fight to Flourish. Um, the initial work is to go out and to uh, recruit from community people who are interested in being involved in this work. And this um, video clip gives a bit of a sense of what their experience um, has been of participating in the program. So hopefully this will work. I'm a person in recovery who, you know, lost everything in the fires and I was really, oh my goodness, am I in a space to be able to do this? And I really, did feel a little bit um, out of depth and I felt incredibly supported um, and the um, facilitators always just allowed me to come at my own pace in and where I could. I've ended up with a stronger mental health from this so I think you know, before I started we were both Fay and I were working really hard on, on, uh, on projects and we were you know, absolutely exhausted. I feel my mental health is much better just that appreciation of walking down the road with you all. Um, yeah, so it's been very good, so I'm very grateful for that. And I've got a really positive um, outlook on all of that now, which I didn't have when I started. <laughs> the foregrounding of Aboriginal wisdom, to me, was something big, that oneness <laughs> of us coming together to find solutions. Yeah, I'm just yearning for it. Deep in walking, deep inside and in the ground and the soles of my feet, I'm yearning for us to find these solutions because it's time, we're running out of time. I've learned to to gain even even with my history in, in the park service and dealing with Aboriginal culture. I think I've learned so much more with people like Aunty Vicky around. And I think that awareness of, of Aboriginal uh, community, uh, that whole uh, holistic well-being process has really, really been important to me. And I think I'll probably carry that with me for the rest of my years, I'd say. But I'd also love to acknowledge you, Mob, that are sitting in this room and have sat in this room many, 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 many times over the last however many months um, and walked on this journey and we've walked on this journey together. We're really building on their networks. We're getting a really good 
mix of people. We're getting to a lot of departments, agencies, and volunteer groups. I felt like those community conversations gave me a really beautiful opportunity to engage with the community in a particular way. And I learned great stuff from some of the individuals because it gave me really deep listening conversations. A, a big thing for me also, Siobhan, is um, um, really communicating with different people in the community that I'm representing. And, 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 and doing that deep listening within the community and having and looking a little bit more broadly and outside of my normal. I, I talk to a lot of people anyway in the community, but um, just opening that up a little bit further. The other value has been I've learned a lot about community recovery and I've, I've been writing about resilience because of cancer business so and recovery. So this has been just another wing, which I'm just trying to in, hoping to incorporate. And I feel like I, I understand a lot more than I did when the house first burned down in 2002. I talk a lot, but when I was out in the real world, I was listening a lot more than I've ever done before. I've learned to uh, listen more and to take my time and think about things and, and not feel sort of inhibited in what I'm saying. We realise that we are not alone. When we got up together with the other co-designers, we realised we're not alone in, in feeling a lack of support and feeling that, you know, where do we go to from here? And the mountains that we have to jump over to get there. And, um, you know, the process that we've been through by holding each other's hands and helping each other, we've got to the top of a lot of those mountains, I think. I'm incredibly grateful for how this time has extended me. Um, you know, I really feel like it's enriched and deepened me deeply. And then because it's the purpose of deepening oneself is what we can then give to the people around us. I'm looking forward to moving forward on what we're setting out to do. How fast that will be, I don't know. Uh, but I know that there's support out there with our co-designers. I'm incredibly proud of the decisions that we made last week. I keep thinking about them and holding them in my heart and just thinking what a great bunch of projects they are and also reflect on the projects that are still in that garden and hope that they will also see fruition as, as um, the years go by. What, what Kate was referring to in terms of the projects that were funded, these... Um, these community members are from Clarence Valley and they are probably the most for the most far advanced of all the four communities. And they ran a process where they um, uh, put forward projects to be funded and then they made the decisions themselves about what would get funded. And so that's a really um, important part of the program is a participatory granting approach so that um, communities themselves are, have more control over where the money goes. Um, some of the things that have been learnt uh, across the, the last 18 months um, of the project is that um, th there's just a few lessons that I'll highlight before I end. Um, one is that uh, it's really important to be community-led, strengths-based and trauma-informed, um, but the consequences of doing this is that it takes longer. Um, you know, it's really, uh, it takes longer when seeking to work with communities who've experienced systematic um, in inequities and have been repeatedly let down by government and others. So really you're trying to not um, repeat that experience and the feedback that the program has received is that it is it feels different from other sorts of projects. Um, that's one thing. Um, uh, I think the foregrounding of Aboriginal wisdom has been really critical. So um, as soon as the um, COVID allowed uh, the program, the program has appointed a senior um, uh, First Nations lead into the program. And he and the community lead have been spending time with uh, traditional owners and uh, elders in each of the four communities to really um, explore what they um, what they think the needs of the community are, to seek their buy-in, to seek um, their, I guess, endorsement of the program's approach. And that's been very positive. There has been a really um, positive response to that. Um, and so we'll be interested to see how that rolls out. But there's a real gap, I think, in the emergency response landscape around foregrounding um, Aboriginal wisdom as part of the response and also including Aboriginal people in the response. Uh, I think 
really trying to be collaborative and open with others is a critical thing the program has found that um, this work is big and you can't necessarily do it on your own. Um, and so that there's a real need to form partnerships with other with other um, organizations, with other communities, um, and with the kind of stated goal of, of building those connections um, across communities as well as between communities and funders. Um, and I think for, for a, a, from a PRF perspective, but also from a um, kind of um, sector perspective, um, it's a really uh, great opportunity to learn how to do this work. I think we don't know necessarily how to do it. Um, we think it's very complex work, um, working with um, communities at different levels of readiness, different um, kind of scales. And so really trying to um, take on board the lessons that we um, have learned and, uh, and apply them as we continue to implement, but also if we continue to do this work elsewhere. Um, I think it is has been quite different from other experiences of bushfire recovery. Um, it's less um, local, um, it's more regional. Uh, there's often appropriation of Aboriginal cultural knowledge and practice and Aboriginal communities don't see the benefit of that. Um, there's a lack of cultural safety. Um, there are some sometimes challenging relationships between communities and local council, so that those have been um, interesting and challenging for the um, community for the program to navigate um, because obviously the councils are really important stakeholders in this work. Um, there's a lot of unresolved trauma from the bushfire but also from before the bushfire for some communities. Um, and I'll just end with some quotes from community about their reflections um, and their hopes for fire to flourish um, and I think uh, Going back to grassroots in our community means there will be more chance of success. Feels like uh, a, a really good way of summing up what the program's trying to do um, and the, the potential benefit of that. So I'll stop sharing now. Awesome. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, it, I just, when I was thinking about it, I in the previous years, you would have described this as a wicked problem, but that even doesn't uh, begin to capture the complexity of, of, of what's happened here, your response, but also the, the, the additional complexity of um, God bless COVID, uh, and that was sarcastic, um, and, and all of the challenges that that brought up um, and, and, and created for you as well. So um, we do have a couple of questions from, uh, oh, we have more than a couple now. Um, but I just, I just wondered, um, the, there's a lot of questions kind of around, I guess, problems or focusing on the problems. But what has been right now, and I know you've got a five-year plan, but uh, at this point, what is the most positive thing um, or the, the thing that you both have pride in about this project? Um, I think from my perspective, it is the um, probably the um, the way in which First Nations knowledge has been foregrounded um, in this space. And I do think that um, you know, Monash Sustainable Development Institute is not an not an Aboriginal-led organisation, so this is occurring within a white institution. But nevertheless, I think the program has done a lot to really um, listen to the challenges that First Nations people have experienced in you know in disaster and in the you know the preparation and recovery from um, those events, and really tried to. Um, see if they can do it differently. Um, and they're, uh, so, so yes, I, I think that's probably the thing that I'm most proud of. And I guess from my perspective, what I'm, what I'm very proud that this program is, is continuing to hold on is to really um, continue to support the idea that this can be led by the community, mm -hmm. um, even though that takes time. And often with these sorts of um, 
situations we want to we want to rush to solve the problem to fix things to make things better and to actually step back a little bit and say well rather than rushing in let's let's give people time to work through the thought process of how to best come at this um, and holding true to that through this is is really great to see and I'm pleased that you brought up the community component because there's a question in here about um, which I think is also, you know, a layered challenge as well is the fatigue that these communities have have had to endure um, from, you know, not only the original um, problem of, you know, drought, fire, um, COVID. I don't know whether the floods have, you know, caused problems. Probably because, you know, that's taken resources away from this as well. But um, has that that fatigue impacted on on the progress or have you been able to um find that the the communities have their own inner strength to sort of continue to march on and and, and co-design and deliver and, and and you know just march forward sorry that was a long question i think it's probably a combination i think that the communities are really fatigued and i think in particularly one community um has really had been so um, so over consulted and so overwhelmed with kind of different kinds of support and different offers of help and you know for them it's been trying to work out well who's legit who's not legit you know um, are, are these people going to be around for the long term are they going to be fly by nights that kind of thing so I think yeah. um, you know their communities that um, uh, so they're having to wade through all those questions I think is on top of what's been ha what's happened and I think um, the reason that communities are at different points um, is partly because of that you know they've had different experience prior experience of disaster um, they also have different um, I guess makeup you know that, that, that they're connected in different ways and, and there's, there's, re there's good research to show th through Melbourne Uni research um, to show that if you've got the strong um, connections within a community um, then you're more likely to recover from these kinds of events better, which sort of makes sense, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, not all communities have those sorts of connections. In fact, some communities have really big rifts, and, and we've found that some of these, some of this, can be really about race, uh, very strong racism within communities. And how do you actually kind of how do you start with that? And what what how, as a program, how do you work through that? So. Yeah, I think that, uh, but I also think that the co-designers have really, they've opted into the program. It's not like where, it's not like anybody said, oh, you, you know, you've got to do this. They've opted in and yeah. I think they've really seen a value in it. Um, so that's been great. And there's been a, a recruitment process for roles in community and they've had really high numbers of applications, which is also super encouraging, I think, in terms of there being readiness and, a, and an interest in people for people in working in their own communities on this stuff. So I think there is energy as well as exhaustion. Yeah. Yasmin, do you have anything to add? No, I think Galena covered that brilliantly. Yep. I just want to pick up on that concept of co-design. Um, when when they were presenting, you know, their ideas about what what that the, the design might look like was there anything that you kind of went oh wow I didn't really think that would take it in that direction or did you just try and have a completely open mind I mean it's hard to be open-minded um all of the time but was there something that really surprised you about a, a direction that they took or a direction that they're they're taking now that you kind of went hmm, that's interesting and I wish I thought of that I think what um I was really struck by was that they are so onto not just what's happening in their community but what's happening in the broader system as yeah. a whole I think we think maybe that communities are only focused on what's happening at the very local level but what I heard in the ideas that that were pitched so we joined the foundation joined um the the, the Monash team and the taxi team with the co-designers to hear their their pitches um, but, you know, they were talking about different models of insurance, which, you know, is a topic that's been in the news so much lately with the floods. Um, yep. They were talking about different methods of communication. You know, how do you, um, like, that's another big issue because com communications infrastructure just goes down and then, you know, how do communities connect with one another? Um, they're talking about um, 
First Nations um, and allyship, you know, allyship between non-First Nations and First Nations people, which are these big questions that I think are occupying us at the national level, um, but they're but they're sort of interpreting them at a community level. So I think that that was I was so struck by that. Yeah. Yes, well, less less about the um, the co-design process, but just about I think one of the really interesting things is the very diverse group of stakeholders that this program is bringing together. So to, to Galena's point around um, how this is moving forward, it's, it's interesting how there's a very strong local focus, but given the dynamic and the makeup as, as Galena was sort of talking through of the different groups of people, everyone from, you know, um, metal manufacturers to Monash University to the local communities, given the, the diversity of views and, 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 and stakeholders that are coming to the table. I think it really creates an opportunity to, to tackle the problem at those various levels as, as, we would, as we would love to see. Yeah. Can I touch on the concept of disadvantage? Because I think um, I know that in literature there's a particular definition of it, but um, we, you know, the general public may not quite understand what that means. Are you able to expand on on what for first part is can you expand on what you know the definition or what you were looking for or defining in disadvantage and I know just that you also said that they didn't think necessarily that they were in a disadvantaged community and I said the second part is is there a disadvantage did you see a disadvantage or come across a, dis a level of disadvantage that you weren't expecting mm -hmm. sorry I asked lots of multiple no. part questions apologize <laughs> that's great um I think it's a neat, really interesting question, um, and I, I think I can answer it slight. I can answer it from the program perspective, but I also think there's a question around for, for PRF around how we define it. Yeah. But um, from the program perspective, we were really looking for things like um, when we when we did our mapping exercise, which is a desktop exercise, I'd have to say, we were looking for things like. Um, uh, vulnerability at age five um, in children, you know, about to start school. We were looking at um, uh, low income, those sorts of things. So um, there are a range of indicators from different sorts of indices around um, what, what, how you might understand disadvantage. So I guess low, low resources, low resources, um, financial and otherwise. I think what's challenging is it's it's harder to measure um, some of those social um, fabric uh, uh, aspects, mm -hmm. and I think there are indices that do that. But um, I think uh, we, yeah, I think I think we really um, started with the desktop level, and then we talked to community about you know what they saw as the need in in community. So um, you know based on what their experience had been, what they thought was important for their particular community. So it was a bit of kind of desktop and a bit of um, ground truthing, I suppose, with, with people with lived experience. Yep. So that's how we got to the definition. And there was a second part to the question. Um, there was, and I honestly can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you kind of addressed it. The, there is another question around, um, up here around um, falling you know the the increasing levels of disadvantage in general in society and people falling through the gaps and I wonder if um given that um you know the the trauma and the and the challenges that occurred in, in that those communities did that did those levels increase or or was it just one of those things where you know um it's just they were so focused on whatever their problems were that they didn't um, necessarily identify as being disadvantaged. I'm happy to do a quick answer, but I think it would be good for Yasmin to contribute something um, on this one uh, in terms of the PRF stuff. But I'm so you come off mute, mute yes. Um, I think that we don't really know. I think we have, and I think part that's part of the evidence base that the program wants to build. So I think we have um, a hypothesis um, that. Um, things did get worse for people um, who were already struggling but I think that it's it's not well it's 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 not well um, kind of known at at a specific mm -hmm. local level and I think there's more work that needs to be done around that and I think the program will do some of that in terms of establishing a baseline in those communities of different sorts of um, indicators 
and then hopefully being able to track those over time. But um, yeah, so Gaz, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I was going to say it's a really good question that was asked around, um, you know, the sort of the definition and disadvantage in general. And I think, um, you know, that's also something that we're continuing to try to learn about is where is it that we can best focus our efforts? Um, what we've what we've sort of, you know, started to find is that and, and started to hone in on is this idea of, you know, disadvantage being this really sticky web that's intergenerational that's entrenched and and that's um, starting to become how we're prioritizing where and how we might seek to to act but I think there's still you know there's still a lot to learn absolutely yeah and I think I mean I think there are people um, certainly certainly living in some of those bushfire affected communities who are really living off the grid who are living very um, you know very kind of tough hard life is hard um, I think if you look at the flood affected areas you know the people who are most likely to be affected are people who live on in cheap housing on the floodplains, and that might be because that's where they can afford to live so you know I think there is some of that sort of information there but I still think we could um, I think that yeah the question around how do you understand um, you know the, the things the social things in a community that um, give both strength, but also if they're in their absence, um, really challenge communities. I think that's an interesting question because certainly some communities do better than others. So yep. yeah. what, what is that magic? What is that magic um, ingredient? So I, I don't think it's just increased. I don't think it's just increased money. I think it's other things. Yeah. Money is good. <laughs> Definitely money is good. But yeah, I think there's 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 social structures, infrastructure, there's the ability to, you know, deal with mental health, which you know came up in that, in that interview. Look, we we've got five minutes to go. So I want to end on a sort of the flourish end of this presentation. Um and I know again it's early in the in the program, but um is there anything um that's indicating that there isn't a flourishing component occurring? Um, you know, are there little green buds? popping out through that that can of the program that can indicate that that, that achievement of flourish is going to occur um I, th I think there I think there is I think sometimes um it's not necessarily what you expect yep. so it might not necessarily be um a new a brand new school hall although you know I think in some communities that that would be good but that takes a little while to to build um but I think you know just in terms of um the participants in the program being incredibly positive about the, their experience of it and the fact that bringing them together, bringing, you know, being together with other people to share their stories and to um, find a place to tell their stories and to work together on um, ideas around how to have a better future for their community. I just think that is really positive. I think it's really um, intangible. And so I think that's hard to, it's hard to convince funders about the value of that. But I do think um, if you think about your own everyday life, those sorts of things um, are really, really important. And so I think um, those are the those are the areas um, where we can see some beginnings of hope. Fantastic. Jasmine. I was going to say also at a macro level, I think, you know, this work is just incredibly important. We know that uh, I was reading a report and I'm going to misquote it, so I'm not going to quote it, but, you know, there's some factor multiple times more disasters that we are likely to see in the future because of the trajectory that we're on. And as a result, we need to understand how to become more resilient and how to deal with these sorts of things into the future. And the fact that we have you know, a group of people, and again, ranging from, you know, very diverse stakeholders all the way down to individuals that have suffered loss in communities, willing to put their hand up and participate and be part of that process to try to define and to, and to help us understand what it is that we can do into the future is just incredibly powerful and, and um, you know, something that is really about hope into the future. I really want to finish on that because that's like the perfect kind of end point um but I just want to give both of you an opportunity to say is there anything else you want to say I think it's been a fantastic program and thank you so much for your time today but any final words before we sign off no just thanks very much for having having us and uh yeah I hope you enjoyed it
Yeah, thank you. I certainly did. Um, so thank you both for your time. Um, it's an amazing piece of work and the very best of luck in, actually no luck, if you'll smash it um, um, in your professionalism and, and go forth and conquer. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.